drum roll, please. No. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to another Friday live stream from Grace of Westminster. It's Friday already. It is. This week has just flown by. Um, so many news. <laughs> so many things have happened. But today we are paying special tribute to the Nikon DF. I've been reading your comments while I've um, been getting everything ready. Thank you for joining us. For those of you that don't know, I am Becky and this is Constantine. That's me. My lovely co-host. Um, if you are not a subscriber to our channel, there's a ton of things that I need to get through. <laughs> if you're not a subscriber to our channel, please do subscribe um, and like the stream. We've got 74 people watching and 16 likes. So let's see if we can um, fix that. Yeah, to the moon. That's right. <laughs> the sky's the limit. Yes. And all those other platitudes. Let's go to Mars. <laughs> um, we do have a coffee fund running. So if you would like to contribute to the coffee fund, you can do so via Super Chat. It's down there. It's a dollar sign. If you see the dollar sign, um, then that's where you, you do that. And one more thing. One more thing. I think it's just one more thing. Yes. Please do vote for us in the Amateur Photographer Good Service Award. We have three days left to be voted for. So uh, almost the finish line. Yeah, we're almost at the finish line. We would very much like to win again. The link is below in the description, but also if you're just sitting there and you want to type it up, it's bit.ly, so bit.ly forward slash vote for GOW. Um, we would massively appreciate it. I know a lot of you have done, done so already. Thank you so much. Right. All right. Are we ready? Yes, no, shall we do the giveaway? Let's do that. And one last thing before we... <laughs> Get on with the uh, Nikon DF. Uh, so we have a book to give away today. It's the Folio, the Folio Society book of the 100 greatest photographs. Now, let's talk about Folio Society first. Yes, yeah, so the Folio Society is a UK company that do very beautiful cloth-bound special editions, for those of you that don't know, um, of very many books. They've done everything from, uh, you know, George Orwell to um, George R.R. R. Martin. <laughs> And it was a wrong picture. <laughs> I don't know what you showed. I didn't see it. It was a PG-18, I'd oh, say. Well, but, uh, yeah. Actually, not safe for work. Oh, it was a bottom. Oh, it's another. <laughs> Got to make sure that YouTube and that's, doesn't... That, that's how we get to... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you would like to win, it's not just those pictures. And you're over 18. And you're over 18. There's a lot of really great pictures in here. And some very, very interesting ones. So, if you would like to win this, you just have to put, I would like to win in the live chat and we'll draw out a winner by the end, won't we? Yes, absolutely. So it's a hundred great photographs, so they're two pages per photograph. That's right. One page is actual photograph, and the second page is about short biography of the photographer yeah. and a little story how this picture was taken. That's right. It's really actually discontinued by the Folio Society now, but I believe it was about 50, 60 pounds when okay, it was Okay, so you out. can't really buy them you anymore. You can't buy it now. But you can win it. You can. Um, Hello to everyone from all over the place. I've been getting some news reports of what the weather was like in various parts of the UK, but we've also got um, viewers from Mexico and New York and Grand Junction, Colorado. All right, Colorado. Um, as well as uh, all over the, the UK and Europe. So thank you. Very yeah, much I had a question to our viewers. What your haircut is this week? The <laughs> lockdown haircut. The lockdown haircut. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are in a sort of, lockdown in the UK at the yeah, moment. Yeah, and I'm definitely due. Hairdressers are closed, <laughs> much to Constantine's dismay. Um, so we are talking about the Nikon DF. It was a camera uh, that I personally really loved. I don't know if you... Did you ever use the DF? Well, when you said and what a camera it was, you know, <laughs> I thought, well, it was a camera and it's a great camera. Yeah. I think... It's a very polarizing camera. I played with this. I didn't use it extensively. I think I used it for about two days. Okay. Yeah. And in my personal opinion, it's a great camera. It's not for me, not for professional use, but I would love to have it as my second camera for leisure. Well, you know. I can see that. I'm going to... I'm gonna sort of debunk that theory yeah. that it's for not for professionals, but not now. I'll do it later. Yes, <laughs> I, I had the D850 and I didn't have a budget to fit another camera, yeah. which it was in a similar price range. Yeah. Because, no, I had D10 at the time. What, what am I saying? But uh, <laughs> uh, it was too expensive for me to acquire it. But uh, it just, I it just as a casual use camera. Absolutely, when you... absolutely. I still desire it. Maybe one day I'll get one. Yeah, it would be nice. Well, we'll we'll talk about that momentarily. Just to give you a little bit of a background, the camera was designed designed by Tetsuro Goto, or as we know him, Goto-san. He um, has now retired.
retired from Nikon, but he was in their employ, I think it was for 40 years. Yes. 40 year staff member of Nikon um, working with the design team. So he helped to design everything from the F3 on up through the F4, um, the F5 and F6. So he was a part of a three team and then his first project uh, where he was head of was F4, wasn't it? That's right, I believe so, yeah. He came and visited us as a kind of on a farewell tour a few years back and came to speak to Nikon. That was amazing. I really enjoyed that meeting. Um, And he was talking about his concepts behind both the DF and also the F4. Um, and actually, he gave us a little bit of an insight into how the Nikon F was designed and created, even though he wasn't part of the, the team. He he had the inside skinny, which was kind of kind of exciting yeah. to, to find out about. So, um, yeah, so we even saw a footage from Sendai Factory. That's right. That was incredible. On an old, was it like an old, old Super 8? Probably, yeah, the Super 8 of VHS, something like that. Yeah. Which... Um, was a prototype camera that he was carrying around <laughs> that he wasn't supposed to be filming on, but did. Anyway, shh. <laughs> yeah, it reminded me of one of the episodes of Office. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So um, so he designed the DF, and as far because Simon Stafford, um, at the lovely Simon, did an interview with Goto San in this issue of Nikon Ona. I've tabbed the, um, the interview here so that I could find it easily, um, which was... When was that? So that was 2019. So that was, I think, just as he was retiring, mm. wasn't it? Yes. Or so, just after. Yeah, just under two years ago. Yeah. And the, the interview, if you are a subscriber to Nikon Owner, um, whether you've received this issue or not, you can access all the back issues through the website. Yeah, it's available electronically in PDF. That's yeah. right. So he, there we go. He started in 1975. No, 1973, it says here. Um, and retired in June 2019. And... There were a lot of cameras that he worked on, but the DF was kind of, I think, a pet project of his. Yes. So the concept behind it was Nikon were on board for the camera idea, but he wanted to design a camera that he personally wanted to use. And that was that was the big thing. They wanted it to be this sort of amalgamation of retro and digital. They didn't quite know how to do it. Goto San came on board and and put this concept forward, and not everyone was on board yeah, at the it, time. It took him some time mm-hmm. to get it through the ranks. It did because I think there was also quite a rumor about it for a while. There was yes, like, that's are true. Nikon going to do a hybrid, um, or are they going to do a digital back for an F six, or are they going to bring out a replacement for the FM three A? There was all kinds of things like that. So what we got was the the DF, um, and the interesting thing about the DF is it's it's so divided in its sort of fan fandom, yeah. I would say. The marmite it of is, the camera. It is the marmite of the camera. I personally, so it came out on the 5th of November, 2013, uh, which was, a f- seven, well, it was 11 months or thereabouts later than yes. the D4, right? Because the D4 came out at the beginning of 2014. That's right. So 13. where were you on 5th of November? I was here. All right. I remember when they arrived and... Um, and I posted a picture. It was like the first picture on my Instagram, I think, is the pic- is me holding the DF. Um, or it's a very early one. So that was that was November. It had the D4 sensor. Mm-hmm. It had the D4 processor, which yes, was XP3. XP3 yeah. yeah, and it had the, the... It was a CMOS sensor. CMOS 16 megapixels. Mm-hmm. And it had the ISO range that... I don't think it was the same as the D4, but it was certainly, in terms of uh, noise levels, mm-hmm. it was comparable to the D4. Yeah, so the, it was in the native between 100 and I think 25,600, and yeah. then you can extend it to 50 ISO on lower end and 204,800 ISO. Yes, exactly. So it would be HI3, I think. That's right. It was called in camera. Um, but the, the main thing that I found amazing was actually the low light performance. It was having used a D4 for concerts mm-hmm. and things like that, classical concerts, having a camera that was that much smaller and also with all the other things that, that the DF gives you, having a processor that would then allow you to shoot at like 12,800 yeah. with relatively low noise. I've got some examples. And you know, the funny thing is the DxO Mark is the company who rates all the sensors. Mm. They actually rate DEF slightly higher than the Nikon D4. In low light capabilities. Well, I suppose it came out 11 yeah. or 10 months later. So it could later. be a slight revision. Yeah, yeah. so then maybe they did something on that. I think the main downside to it was probably the autofocus system. Yes, it came from G600, um, which is what? 2151? 
Uh, it's 39. 39. 39 points. Yeah. And it wasn't very fast compared to D4. No, it wasn't. But also, after the DF, we saw the D750. Yes. And the D750 had that incredible low-light AF um, system where it yeah. could autofocus at minus, I think at the time it was minus one EV. Yes. And we've we've kind of expanded since yes. then. But that was one thing that I thought felt like the DF could have really benefited from. Was, That's true. Was That's the, true. But well, you forgot the compatibility with all range of Nikon lenses, including pre eye glass. Yes, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> it's getting there. <laughs> so one of the biggest points, and I have to point out this DF right here, this is the only DF we have in the shop. This is the special gold edition. So it's got gold detailing around the special edition 51.8G lens. It's got gold. I will hold it up to the camera in a minute and then I'll bring it closer so you can see it. In fact, let me Why won't you let talk me do I'll... that. You want to do that? Yeah, I'll okay. be the, the model. Okay, the model. so you have to bring it right up. There we go. Um, now you have to autofocus on it. Yes, there we go. So, so you can see that it's got gold on the DF nameplate and on the Nikon nameplate. It's got gold around the special edition lens. It's got... The buttons on the top, there we go, are all gold as well. And the shutter button, any of the kind of contact points were gold. And even the little strap plugs are, are gold. What about the base? Has the base yes, got any gold? The, yeah. The battery is all light. Yeah. It's also gold. You have to be very careful with that. Wow. Is it 18 karat? I believe so. Um, but you know what? I actually can't remember. I'm trying to, does it write it on the box? No, it doesn't. I have to look. It's on our website. Anyway, so if you want a DF, and I, as far as I know, this is the... Only one. This is the only one that we're going to have for a little while. Um, then we have a gold one. <laughs> but in terms of compatibility, the the gold DF, uh, well, any of the DFs had the ability to actually push the the little aperture indexing lever out of the way, so that you could safely mount pre AI lenses. So you could use pre AI. AI and AIS, as well as the full gamut of F-mount lenses, and obviously now we've got um, AFS, AFP, AFD, all of those were all functional on the DF. So you, the, the, the I think the promotional image that they had for DF when they launched it was a 51.2 pre-AI with a scalar focusing That's ring. That's right, yeah, exactly. So it was really pushing the point of, um, hey, this works with everything. That's right. Pretty much. And if, that you, was... if you like heritage and you've got fountain pen, yeah. a mechanical watch. <laughs> <laughs> then then you should yeah. have the DF as well. Definitely. Um, it was, um, John points out, it was a great camera at the time. Just remember that it wasn't intended for mass sales. I mean, certainly, you know what I found so funny was when it came out, we got a massive amount of interest and we had a big waiting list as we often do and we got a, a large selection of bodies kits black and chrome and then we went to a nikon school training session mm -hmm. where most of the other retailers had never picked one up yes and the df had been out for quite a while by that point it was i like, think we were so. literally the, the our shop sold the most dfs at that time yeah in uk yeah exactly um now as a as an interesting kind of predicament, it came out in 2013. I had a D600 that I wasn't happy with. Mm -hmm. I used the DF and I wrote a review for the Gazette mm -hmm. um, at the time. And I'll show you some pictures from that um, mm -hmm. shortly. But I was trying to decide whether to buy the DF or, or what to do. And then the D750 came out. Mm -hmm. And the D750 with its slightly better low light autofocus system, mm -hmm. obviously a, a two card slots, it has yeah. video. There were a few other bits and pieces that the DF didn't have. Couldn't stretch the DF hundred, could you? No, <laughs> I didn't want. This is the problem. <laughs> I have so many manual focus lenses, and using those on a high resolution sensor is like completely pointless. I agree. So this was the sweet spot sensor. Yes, absolutely. But it was very much a dilemma between like my heart was telling me to buy the DF, my head was saying D seven fifty. Yeah, no, I could I could definitely see that logic. Yeah. And I think Steve Neal pointed out earlier he had a similar thing. The D seven fifty was just better for his hand. Mm -hmm. Um it was definitely more comfortable. Also, the DF has a much smaller battery. Yes, it's uh, in L14, 14. 14, which came from D5600 series That's cameras. That's right. And then a single SD card slot. That's so, right, yes. So, you know, a lot of people decided that that, that was it. it. It was not a professional enough Deal breaker. Yeah, completely. It's that second card slot. That's get it. Every time. Right off. 
<laughs> immediately and at once. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, David David Gifford says he has a DF and a D750 and finds the DF hits focus more reliably than the D750. Here we go. That's interesting. Um, Roy asks, do they still make it? No. Now, no, they don't. However, two about two and a half years ago, I think it was, Nikon moved all of their DF sales from dealership to Nikon store only now that meant the one that doesn't ship at the moment the one that doesn't ship yeah. at the moment. if anyone's i've had so many phone calls about this if anyone's wondering the the store notice is for the nikon store they're not currently fulfilling orders from the nikon store it's got nothing to do with our stock if you didn't know that already you must catch up with our podcast <laughs> <laughs> but um so the nikon store became the only place you could buy a df about two and a half odd years ago and they made yes. it a really good price point as well um now you can buy refurbished ones from there but you can't mm. buy so you can still buy them mm. i mean i i had a little look before the stream just to see if you could it said that they had a refurb kit mm. i don't know if that um is up to date but um but they didn't have body onlys anymore mm -hmm. so anyway very interesting um david says he'd like to see a df2 i certainly think we should yeah we should uh, speculate. I think we will definitely speculate. <laughs> we will before. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Yeah. yeah. And Roy says he has colleagues in the forensic fraternity that love the DF, mm. which is interesting as well. I actually have at least, I have two friends. One does concerts with mm -hmm. the DF mm -hmm. exclusively, and the other does sort of like events and shows and things like that. And yeah. again, is, a, is purely a DF user, doesn't use anything else. From... Nikon's perspective, it was such an odd release because it didn't fit their lineup of cameras. No, it was kind of whoop on the side. <laughs> Even when they were doing promotional materials, showing us the examples, it was sitting somewhere on the side. Yeah. And the thing about this is maybe, yes, it's not the best professional camera, but if you're a keen enthusiast, mm. if you're a street photographer, if you're a um, portrait photographer, it's a, such a great camera because it does look like film camera. Yeah. And a lot of people, especially when you're taking pictures, of, um, don't feel that... Uh, you know, tense when you put a big camera with a big lens on them. Yeah. So it definitely has its own use. Yeah, and sure. that's why I think that, let's say, for a professional job, I would probably get the 850. But for something, my personal project, something that's a, uh, something that I want to do myself, mm -hmm. I would have this camera. Yeah. For that specific reason. And you know how the marketing campaign was very much um, the guy in his outdoor gear going for a hike and yes. it was sort of like in that Scottish countryside yeah exactly in the Scottish Highlands mm -hmm. somewhere and it was very much like pure photography was the yes. was the concept no video literally no video in it at all um and putting and just turning the dials yes. and all that kind and of what stuff. I like about this it's it's going away from all this marketing spiel of the megapixels and autofocus points and all that rubbish by actually talking about photography itself. And that's what we forget nowadays. Yeah. Actually, the process of taking pictures. Yes. And this camera takes you away from this. It almost feels like a film camera because of this. Exactly. And all we talk about nowadays is numbers, numbers and numbers and not photography itself. Mm -hmm. So it definitely yeah. kind of took the the scientific number mumbo jumbo out of the yeah. equation and made you think a little bit more about the process of taking a picture um interestingly now so i'm gonna um no not there <laughs> i'm gonna show you some pictures if i can of i use the df with a bunch of different lenses most of them were manual focus lenses i've done something here with the thing let me just try and not have that fill the screen you're, this is where you're supposed to fill the gap so that i can talk okay. okay so you're ready now i'm ready now <laughs> so these um this was just you know sit, uh, in blackfriars bridge actually mm -hmm. oh it's, it's, of... it's oxytow isn't it yes. yeah okay. exactly and this is kind of low light stuff i was shooting not particularly long exposures so i was trying to push the iso levels mm -hmm. this was when i was doing the the um the gazette review mm -hmm. lovely um, colors yeah it was actually a really really nice guy and I, all of these pictures i didn't edit because i wanted to show what it was like straight out of the mm -hmm. camera so i took a little trip down to the natural history museum i took a an old 43 to 86 okay yeah that's zoom. I know that one. <laughs> it's, it's a fun zoom everyone hates yes <laughs> Um, I took the 105 2.5, I took a 24 f 2.8, a 16mm fisheye, and I had something else in the middle, but I can't remember what it was. So, And I shot, all of the, the black and whites were shot black and white in camera. 
this is a church on on Kensington Church Street, it's actually. The only church in this England. Is, yeah, <laughs> this is the 43 to 86, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a closer shot. There's one that I will, and this is the Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. This is 3,200 ISO. I don't know because this is, oh. Well, that looks pretty clean. Yeah, I'm trying to make it, I can't control it. <laughs> Stop zooming. <laughs> so if you have a little look, this is probably about 100% or thereabouts, but 3,200, I thought in terms of low light performance was pretty impressive. I then took another one. They're, they're not in any particular, they're in alphabetical sequence, mm -hmm. which is not helpful. But this one was taken at 12,800. And again, I'm trying to control the the thing. It looks pretty good. It's and, pretty clean and, and it's pretty sharp. the noise looks very filmic. It's not a chroma noise. Exactly. So. I generally found, because I had the D4 for a little while for concerts and stuff like that, I found that the dynamic range was particularly nice. This was an example of the dynamic range where you've got the shadows, like heavy shadows on one mm. side and heavy highlights, and the camera still managed to even it out a little mm -hmm. bit. Again, unedited. This is with the 16mm f3.5 AI. Yeah, you got a bit of distortion on this one. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I went, this was the second trip to the Natural History Museum and they were closed. So I had to stand and poke the lens through the, through the gate. Yeah, um, did you have a magnifying glass filter <laughs> on the lens? Anyway, oh, no, I wanted to show this one because this was taken with the 105 2.5. And this one, this shot actually sold a DF to someone because straight out of the camera... They said this shot sold for 100 million if pounds. If only, no, but it was straight out of the camera. This is the JPEG compression of it, but it was super sharp straight out of the camera with a mm -hmm. lens that was made in 1969. And um, that was a good year. It was, <laughs> it was a good year. Um, and it was so sharp and the colors were so good that um, I can't remember who it was now, but someone said to me, was that taken straight out of the camera? I said, yes, it was, because it was in the Gazette. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, yeah. I'm buying one. Sold. Sold. Um, so, those were just some of the some of the things that I did, but I've seen so many pictures taken with this camera, um, which have been everything from like super grungy low light concerts to um, I've done classical work with it to sort of like wild steampunk events to I think that you could probably also shoot weddings with it quite yeah. happily. Yeah, and with no couple of photographers who use them. Mm -hmm. Again, I, it's found this niche. Yes. Despite it, of all the heat. It did. It did. Oh, look, Kevin. Ah, oh, Kevin said, thank you for mentioning Nikon Owner. I didn't know about that. Now I'm a subscriber. Well, you're welcome, Kevin. That's fantastic. Uh, oh, the link. Oh, yeah. If anyone else would like to subscribe, the link is in the description box. So you can do that. The Gazette um, is a separate publication that's done by Grays. That is... I would say biannual sort of thing. Mm. Sometimes we try and do it once a year, but we're working on this year's one at the moment. That's um, a soft copy, so it only comes out electronically. That's completely free. If you sign up for our newsletter, then you will actually get access to to the gazettes when when we publish them. So if you're not signed up for the newsletter, you should be. Is the link for that below too? Is there a link for the newsletter yeah. below? Amazing. <laughs> and uh, for the Nikon Owners magazine, you write some articles for them. I do. I write an article every issue, pretty much, um, of of some description. Oh, there we go. Jeremy, Jeremy said the peacock is a super shot from a vintage lens. 105 2.5 is my favorite. And the vintage lens on this particular camera work really well. They I don't do. know how, I don't know why, but... It's just... that sensor. Yep, yeah, I agree. It is that sensor. Now, for those of you interested, if you were looking at getting a DF and you had pre-AI lenses, um, so there's a little trick uh, you might have seen a certain Grays Westminster staff member do a, a video on what we call non-CPU lens data mm -hmm. was that what you called your video was it me it was you that was me <laughs> you think yes. manual focus lenses on your digital camera um now and I've also done a video on how to tell the difference between these different types of lenses but when you put an old pre-AI lens on the DF you have to move the lever out of the way. I don't want to do it on this one yeah. for the simple reason that this is a brand new, unused, untouched camera and I don't want to even take the lens off it. Um, but you have to move the little aperture indexing lever out of the way. When you program in your lenses, so when you tell the camera, I'm using a 50mm f1.4 so that the camera can meter, mm -hmm. on the DF you've got that extra option of whether or not it's a non-AI lens or an AI lens. Mm -hmm. If it's a non-AI lens, 
you have to set the aperture on the lens, but then you also have to set the aperture on the camera. So it's an extra... It's a bit of a double work. Yeah. <laughs> so you set the 5.6 on the aperture ring, and then you switch, you know, move the dial as well to get yes. 5.6. Yeah. And then it works. Yeah, exactly. So um, it, it was a little bit... This is one thing that the tactile dials and stuff like that maybe maybe put some people off. Mm. It's because it was almost too much to do. Yes. But I, I never found that much of a problem. I find that this camera has a bit of a mixed identity. It mm -hmm. doesn't know what it wants to be. So <laughs> um, Having an identity crisis. Well, in a way, I, I feel it's possibly um, slightly undercooked, and that's why we want, all want version 2. Yeah. But because it's got the manual knob, so it definitely appealed to photographers switching from film to digital. Yeah. And you can do lots of things like uh, there as well. But then the camera also contains the modern dials. Yes. And you've got the back wheel and you've got the really shaped front wheel. Um, so you can do the same things by, by two different ways. And I think that's what confused a lot of people at the beginning of yeah. which way I do that. Do they overlap? If I do it there, and then the manual knob, what's going to happen? That's very true. In fact, yeah. if you kind of ignored the back of the camera, the top and the front, you could pretend is a film camera. Exactly. And then you look at the back and you go, hold on, there's a shutter speed dial on the top, but there's also your, your main command dial that exactly. changes shutter speed. Exactly. So one thing that I, I personally liked that about the DF, I liked the fact that you could put it onto thirds of a stop, or yes. thirds of a step, mm -hmm. as it's called on there, and then you could control your shutter yep. speed normally. Or if you wanted to get fully tactile, then you change your shutter speed on the top dial, change your aperture on the lens. I personally <laughs> would like the camera choose just one direct and just, <laughs> just go do all manual. Just go all manual because you're not trying to be everything for everyone. Yeah. Just design it with all the manual knobs. Yeah. Let us do things the old fashioned way. And I wonder if when Goto San designed it, um, he perhaps suggested all manual dials yeah. and then someone went, but what about the... It has to be modern as what well. What about that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It has to be. Because DF, as far as I understood from the marketing, was digital fusion. So it was supposed to be yes. a fusion between them. Um, David said he'd like to win the DF special edition. <laughs> the competition is not for the Aren't we all? 5,000 pound camera, <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> Once we have 5 million subscribers. <laughs> Maybe. And our budget allows for this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then we can buy one to give away. Um, but now, Roy pointed out an interesting, an interesting thing. He said, probably inspired by the Fuji X series. What came first? <laughs> <laughs> the chicken or the egg? The chicken Fuji egg. or the... I had. I had. You had. And yes, both <laughs> yeah. of us. Had. We're both guilty of that. Yes. So I had a, an X-T10, which was my uh, poor man's answer to yes. the DF, which was basically a crop sensor, for those of you who don't know, APS-C size sensor, yes. um, 16 megapixel. I got the um, the 18 mil 1.8, which is basically like a 28. 18 F2. Mil. F2. Yes, the little kind of it, almost yes, pancake. pancake yeah, lens, exactly, lens. with the little aperture ring. Yes. So then I could control everything manually, yes. and it was all very tidy. Yes. And um, what did you have? I bought X Pro One right. when it first came out in Japan, not even in UK. Oh, wow. I was in Japan at the time, and that's why I went to map cameras. Yes. I bought my X Pro One. I bought 18 mil F2, which is 28 equivalent. I've got 35 1.4 at the time as well and I shot all my Japan trip there wow. and the reason I bought it a I love the way it looked it's just beautiful piece you know of equipment. <laughs> that become an egg for, um, uh, Fuji. <laughs> but th that's the thing it's and uh, Nikon didn't have a small camera yeah that would provide you know well a the looks not the looks the looks are not that important but provide uh, the camera in small form factor yes I don't use my J50 for personal work. I use it, it's a commercial work. It, it's a money maker, you yeah. know, but I like to have a small camera yeah. um, to take with me for my personal projects, for my passion, la passion. Uh, for you know, for so, la passion. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that, that's why I bought X-Pro1, and I think they did a really good job. And I actually then later on eventually bought X-Pro2. And then last year, me and you, we sold our Fuji's because Nikon came out with mirrorless camera. That's right. With a small camera to take with you on holiday or other things. Yeah. But what I liked about Fuji equipment, it's they, they kind of figured out what it needs to be. Yeah. They had those analog dials and controls. Yes, they did. X-Pro1 was rubbish in autofocus. Yeah, but it was enjoyable to use. It was enjoyable to use. Yeah. And I think that, let's say, if you're going to look at DF1, DF2, perhaps, mm -hmm. maybe Nikon ha can have a look at these cameras from Fuji. Just have a look how they work and why they work. And also having a look at, because someone earlier mentioned, I would love to see a ZF, yes. which 
I like that idea very much. So looking at a mirrorless camera, this is for you, Nikon. This is our, our contribution. Um, our love letter. <laughs> yeah. If you were going to create a DF2, if it was a mirrorless design. It has to be mirrorless. To make it smaller, but still with able to use all of the, the heritage yes. glass. I think would be the that would be the most amazing it has to be in shape or form closer to fm series cameras or yeah. f3 while df looks like f3 it's still quite um quite a lot larger and i think the main difference uh, for that is actually the distance between the lens to the sensor yes and uh, because of that the camera is quite chunky yeah and I think for a lot of users, they thought, well, they want a slightly slimmer camera for that. So mirrorless would solve this problem. Yeah, exactly. My, our lovely producer has just told us that Goto-san is with us today. So hello. hello. Goto-san. Thanks for joining us. We are absolutely delighted to have you here. Um, in fact, I was going to, um, this was from, this is the man himself. Um, this was back when he was doing his little um, tour in 2019. And he actually, when he did the interview with Simon, um, he showed, this is him holding his DF. That's his personal camera. His personal camera. And you're going to see when I, so the amount of customization that this camera has, let me just see, we're not in the way. No. So soft shutter release. You've got a, a Nikon soft shutter release, which is the same for the FMs and the FEs. It's the little. It's um, old fashioned screw one. You yeah. Could, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, he had his name engraved on a little gold plate on the front, which is this aperture um, aperture control dial here. Um, although it's not a, a gold camera, his was actually one of the original. But it's a limited edition of one. That's right. Only one that's engraved that like that. And then if you have a little look on top, this one doesn't have it, but he had a custom engraved Nippon Kagaku uh, hot shoe cover, which was made by a friend of his. Um, and was made specifically to his specifications, uh, which is an amazing... I mean, the thing that I find quite interesting, he's also... He had a grip on his, which you can see on the bottom there. And I wanted to ask you, is got a sound 28 or 24 millimeter shooter? And I can clearly it's see that he's a 24. 24, 24 2.8. And that is a pre-AI converted. Shape, yeah. yeah, it's converted. You can see with the two aperture numbers. And then I think I've got a picture of the back there. There you go. You get a closer look on the um on the hot shoe cover but anyway so i think one one of the things that i remember from his sort of talk to us was that he wanted a camera people could play with and modify and adapt to really make it their own yes. it became a very personal thing can you do it 50 look that good no no <laughs> although i know someone that gold plates them like puts skins on them and stuff but that's not the same <laughs> yeah uh you can do that with them as well like a kind of um skin leather and all yeah. this stuff crocodile yeah and... you totally can and um and there is i think i can't remember the name of it but there is like a df appreciation society that's not what it's called but there is a df club is it in japan or in japan yeah. yeah exactly which he is um part of so anyway so it does still have very much yeah df is quite popular in japan yeah very yes popular. it is yeah. and i think you know that maybe people were quite surprised a number of people asked me um back in the day you know oh is the df a camera that you guys sell very often and we did but i'm sure that other dealers probably had yeah. <laughs> had sort of maybe not so much success with it or didn't understand it in in the same way that yeah because you have to have soul to understand it isn't it <laughs> oh it got fired you I'll can't take that now. can't take that back yeah. it's live <laughs> um a couple of people said that they would love um to see or to have seen it as a bit more like an FM or yes. an FM three A or an F three, and as you pointed out, it is the flange distance. Yes, so mirrorless system would solve the issue of size. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I would love Nikon to re to release maybe the same lenses, but more retro kind of fit. You know, with a retro casing on them. It would be interesting because if they did a Z, let's just say it's called a ZF. Why yes. not? Um, if they if they made a ZF, then it would have the Z mount. So what, yes. then they'd have to do adapters and stuff. Well, and release fifty one eight, uh, you know, limited edition. Mm. How they, like they released fifty one eight um, for Nikon GF. It's true, and then make it just retro styled and with the FTZ. Because the beauty of the FTZ is that you can use all those pre AI lenses. Exactly. Um, it doesn't cause any technical difficulties. If you want to really lose some sleep, you can watch the video where I mounted the. I think it was the 6 mil f5.6 protruding yeah. fisheye onto Living on an edge, Becky. 
<laughs> it's like a £30,000 lens yes. and put it on the FTZ and then put it on a Z6 camera. Don't try this at home, kids. It was <laughs> very hair raising, but it worked. Um, but you do have to turn the image stabilization off. Otherwise, the sensor will <laughs> probably take a few knocks to the mm. back of the lens. Um, anyway, there we go. Someone was saying what we need, figgies. Dot com was saying what we need now is a Nikon one star range finder mirrorless that would be proper retro Nikon one system mm. that's going back a little bit isn't it <laughs> I don't know how that would work I have a few I know a few Nikon staff members who are still massive fans of, the, um, of the I pretend it never existed personally but uh... <laughs> all right before I read any more comments um I have to say thank you to Ian and John and Terry, who puts his coffee fund towards your haircut. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Stephen, I need one. I need one desperately. Stephen, Richard, who's trying to watch with a snoring bulldog by his side. Aww. And Jeremy, um, we do have Ian L 15 Cs now just in. So, um, Jeremy, if you are due one, you can place an order. You Straight might from the Netherlands. That's right. Exactly. Um so thank you to all of you. Um, just a little reminder, we have 217 people watching and only 77 likes. So please do give us a thumbs up and obviously subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. <laughs> um, so uh, Tharuni says um, that they have a D5600. We did a kind of dedicated stream to those smaller bodies. To little Ds. Yeah, to the little Ds. So you can have a little look at that if you're if you're interested in what we what we thought about those smaller cameras. We love them. They're great little cameras. I mean, the DF is very different to anything like that. Yeah. Um, the thing about DF mm. is, yes, it's expensive, but at the same time, it's not designed to be sold in volume, I think. Yeah. It's a very niche product for very niche group. And in a way, it's a sleeper hit because yeah. we still have people using them and still people looking for them. Yeah. That's the thing. So when ZF comes out, of course, it's going to be out of the kind of, I wouldn't say out of the left field, but uh, yeah. it definitely would be different from the rest of the Z cameras. Yes. But at the same time, why not? Why not? Exactly. Yeah. Ben asks if you use the Z mount, won't it increase the size again with the converter? I mean, yeah, with the FTZ, you'd have a small body and then you'd be adding an extra sort of inch. But the lenses are fairly small. But the lenses so are quite tiny. Yeah. yeah. So basically, once you mount it, something like 28 mil 2.8 yeah. manual focus, it will be the size probably of 28 1.8 um, or 35 1.8 on Z series. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Those two together. Um, it would be lovely if there was a slim FTZ, you know, one that... Because mm -hmm. I wondered why they needed to make it so big. Like, mm -hmm. I thought it could just be almost two amounts just squished together. Mm -hmm. There's probably a reason for it um, that is something to do with engineering that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, now, Jan says, of all the features I miss most from my F-Series cameras, it's the interchangeable viewfinders. Mm -hmm. Action finders on the F3 and F4 were superb. And actually even interchangeable focusing screens mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. using manual lenses. This was one thing that so many people asked me uh, when this came out was, can we have a split screen? You know, no, you can't. <laughs> Not on a digital camera because it will upset the autofocus system. However... On live view at that time was mm -hmm. still, I would say, quite an early yeah. version of live view. And that's why I'm saying that it still feels a little bit undercooked. Yeah. Because I... all those things could be added there. You know, add, put additional screen in the box. Yeah. You know, um, like those little things that could make it a big hit. Yeah. I mean, it's still a hit. You know. But yeah, exactly. It was still a massive hit. Yeah. But like things that would maybe convince the masses, yeah. which... Um, which was perhaps what not what the target audience was. Um, Go to Sun says, I know all your requests for future cameras, so you know. Thank you, Go to Tracking. <laughs> um, it is an optical reason, Ben. Thank you. I wasn't sure what the technical optical reason is, but you're quite right. There is a reason for it. Um, has everyone given up hope of a remade Nikon F limited edition? I mean, go to Sun. Mr. Go to Sun. <laughs> he's retired. He's not, so he's probably still got a d dipping a toe in. Well, the I'm computer. sure he's got a couple of phone numbers in his uh, <laughs> phone book to find out. But <laughs> a Nikon F limited edition. What they did do for the hundredth anniversary, which we don't have here, but we do have downstairs, is a was it a quarter size Nikon F? Yes. And it came with a tiny little roll of film. Yeah, and you could unscrew the lens. You could. You could take the lens off. It wasn't a working camera. Um, but, it was, you know, it was a special edition for the 100th anniversary. It's very tiny, tiny little thing. It's beautiful and um, and lovely. Mate. Oh, it's almost it's almost midnight in Japan. Um, thank you for staying with us. Thank you. <laughs> we really appreciate it. 
Um, now, there was a comment that I saw earlier that I wanted to read out, but now I have to... Carmen said she would like to see the return of Good Primes being offered in place of Kit Zooms um, as a standard lens, just generally, mm -hmm. which I find quite interesting, actually. It is, but I understand the logic of Nikon including the Zoom lenses. Sure. It's, it's just, unfortunately, Prime uh, lens uh, market, is it's smaller compared to Zoom lens market. It would be yeah. quite nice if they did did do, you know, yeah. here's a 50, and you just have to go and work with that, though. <laughs> like, you have to I'm learn. Sorry, we don't sell Zoom lenses. <laughs> it's 50, or we can't sell your camera. Nothing. <laughs> I'd be just interested to see, particularly yeah. if people are... Uh, what, what, let me just interrupt you for a second. What I want to say about this camera, and yeah. in particular, what Nikon does best, they release the statement products. Yes. DF is a statement product. Yeah. 58 0.95 is a statement product. Yes. Just look at the other camera manufacturers. Who releases something like this? It's very that, true. That's not going to sell in volume, but it's there. So, you know, who does that? There's not many people yeah. who do. It's and that's point. why I have a really deep respect for Nico for this. It's yeah. just, you know, you you got to have something to do with that. Yeah. I have the word, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Don't say it. Not not live. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's true. It's a very gutsy move. Yes, guts. That's the word I was looking for. Was not the, the other one. That was the part of the anatomy yes. you were looking yes. for. <laughs> like, help me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, exactly. Um, now... Interestingly enough, it's not listed. This one's not listed yeah. on our secondhand online oh, you shop. You can't buy it. You can't buy it's it. It's mine. No, but we did have it listed on the shop at one point. I was just well, double checking. It's, it's not. Yeah. Speaking. I wonder why. Yeah. I'm not sure. Well, while you find out, yeah. speaking of this edition, this edition was only available in Japan. That's right. And we are the only company that was allowed to sell it abroad. In the UK. Yeah, yeah. we had to get it in writing as well. We did. It's very. It's a very good yeah. point. Because generally speaking, if we get sent something special from Nikon um, like this, it's not for us to sell. It's for us to to have. So, yeah, there might be a reason for that, though. So we'll, I'll work out what that is. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> work out what that is. I have to ask Gray. Um, but I'm glad that we had one physically in the shop, yes. at least to to be able to show. Um, a couple of people have mentioned Fujis and things like that. As you mentioned, we moved away yeah. from Fuji because yeah. Nikon then had their own mirrorless offering, yeah. and I was more than happy. To be honest, I personally really struggled with the Fujis. I had two. I had an XT. Actually, I had three. Mm -hmm. I had what was the original? Was it an X100? Well, X Pro One was their first mirrorless. It wasn't that one. And then they released X E One, X T Ten, and X T One. I had an X T Ten. X T Ten was their entry level one. one. Anyway, it was. It had a, a lens. I didn't have it for very long, obviously. <laughs> so X Pro One was the only one that has a rangefinder style body where you had electronic screen and optical yes. screen merged together. I had so one that's of those what I had for about three months. I didn't like it. <laughs> So I, I couldn't it. even remember the name of it. I love. Um, um, I like Fuji. I think what they do is great. Uh, but as soon as Nikon came out with their mirrorless system, I personally switched to Nikon. Yeah, and I and I also found because I had the XT10 and then I went for the XT20, thinking, okay, maybe I'll just keep going with mm. the system and and see. But actually, if the Z50 had existed back then, I probably would have ended up with the Z50 because the Nikon One system just didn't do it for me. It wasn't. It was that tiny sensor. Mm. That little, what do they call it? CX sensor in the Nikon. No, that was Next Pro One then. No, I'm oh, talking about Nikon, Nikon One. Nikon One CX sensor, so it's uh, two thirds sensor, isn't it? Or, or almost, it wasn't wrong, quite. Yeah. It was like two point seven crop instead of one. And that's why Nikon One system never clicked with me. <laughs> because of the size of the sensor. Because of the size of the sensor. Yeah. Um, Kotick, Timmy, what, uh, I'm just having a look. Wouldn't a 6.3 50mm hamper an autofocus system by providing insufficient light to work with? Not with a current. No, they, they can focus at their fate effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Not with a current um, autofocus system. Maybe with an older camera, that would have been yeah. an issue. Um, Anything from, I think, D800 or D810, uh, they start to focus at their fate, and all generations before that were yeah. at 5.6. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Lubomir says hello to Mrs. Producer. It's Miss. <laughs> Miss <Ms>. Producer, <laughs> darling. Um, and there was another... Uh, oh, here we go. Andy said, one thing that would be desirable would be to have a Z kit with f2.8 lenses. Ooh, that would be nice. Yeah, pancake style. We know there are two on one pancake. Um, There's two on the, the roadmap. Yes. It was a 28 and a 45. Yes. I don't know if that's still the case. 
I am very much looking forward to those pancake lenses. He was talking about the, like the 24 to 70 2.8 being in a kit. But to be honest, if you're going to buy, we could probably create those kits because yeah. that's what we did. If you've ever looked at our website and you've gone, oh, they have a D850 24 to 70 2.8 kit. That's not a Nikon kit. That's something that we... We make it together and we pass on the small saving to you, but exactly. effectively we're doing it ourselves. Yeah, exactly. So we could probably yeah. do the same thing if we had... Z62s and mm. Z72s. <laughs> but speaking of including prime lenses and kits, I, th I think something like ZF2 yeah. would be a perfect camera for that. Yeah. Do even a three lens kit. Yes. In a fancy box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Some would be Some sort of, you know, pelly case. Okay, with know. wheels on. It exactly. has to have wheels on it. Exactly. Um, San says, I am using the latest Ricoh GR3 as the concept is similar to the DF and the designer is my friend. Ah, interesting. I'm going to have to check that one out after the stream. I won't do it yeah, right now. The, it gets such a good write-up online. Again, for street photography, those cameras are fantastic. Yeah. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that one has a built-in fixed lens. Oh, you might be right. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, again, there's a certain group of people who does that. And if you go look at the photography there, it's incredible street photography, documentary photography, as we call it, magnum-style photography. So this documentary street life look to that. Yeah. Exactly. There's a lot of that kind of photography in the book that we're giving away today, actually. Yes, it's interesting. Absolutely. Oh, uh, it's very... highlight again. It's the Polio Society book of the 100 Greatest Photographs. If you want to... Limited edition. We've had quite a few people say that they want to win. But if you do want to win, you've got a few more minutes before we do our draw. Um, quite a lot of people also fans of the Nikon One system. I think if we'd had... If we had had one in the shop, we've got a couple of like... We've got a J2 and something mm -hmm. else lurking around. I wouldn't mind, as much as you don't like the system, no, I wouldn't look, mind it's, it's doing a stream me, but, on it. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, because everyone gets equipment they like. That's right. That's, that's the beauty of that. That's right. It's not, we are not here to start the war, you know, <laughs> between different systems or different brands. We love photography. That's right. That's what it's actually about. And exactly. Everyone chooses their different tools. And I had a V1 for that was before i got the fuji yeah. and yeah. the main issue that i had with that was actually the low light performance and the, because the sensor was so tiny but um but yeah there's there there were a few really interesting car cameras in that i think j2 when it first came out was one of the first cameras that had 4k in there oh yeah and they did they had this sensor produced by i forgot the name of the company up or something like remember. this and it didn't have rolling shutter. Again, it was mm. one of the first Nikon cameras without rolling shutter. And it's funny you mentioned that there's, sometimes their smaller cameras had these quite innovative yes. features that yes. just kind of got snuck in there. I would be very... Maybe one day we will do a Nikon One stream. Um, Speaking pull, of that, on board. <laughs> I know that, let's say, Fuji yeah. does, they release the flagship, yeah. the most expensive model, and they start to work from the top to the bottom. Yeah. So slightly making it cheaper, using the same parts down to the cheapest model. Yeah. With Nikon, it's slightly different. Yeah. They introduce new features pretty much across the range. Yeah. And whatever comes there at the time, they implement that, those features in the new camera plus extra on top. That's right, because like, you look at the D780, for example, it's not their flagship body, no. but it took the best bits from the Z6, the D850, and the D750, and kind of made yeah, it's the a best baby. hybrid camera, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, for sure, I would say so. Um, now, uh, yes, just sent, David pointed out that he's just sent his broken AW1 for repair. It, it is, there's another one, there was an underwater camera. This is a whole system, yeah, we're going to have to cover it. It took me a couple of seconds, yeah. <laughs> You're um, like, what is she talking and about? And AW1 has its own 10 millimeter water sealed uh, lens as well, yes. AW10. Yes, that's right. Um, Jared speculates that with Nikon closing production in Japan and moving all production and Z only to another country, her hopes for traditional Nikon DF type camera projects might be a thing of the past. I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't say so because their designers will still design things and there are always things in the works, even if they don't end up on our shelves. Yeah. We live in a global village. Yeah, we do. That, that's the thing. You know, we're people of the world. We, we're not you know, limited to one area. That's right. I'm Russian, I live in London. You know. No, that, you know, <laughs> so, so you can design something, yeah. you could have the Japanese design team yes. design the DF, it can still be produced I mean, people elsewhere. can still get a phone and dial a number, I'm not even talking about the internet. So, you know, um, <laughs> with those things, people work in different countries nowadays. Yeah. So we have a person who is working from France at the moment. Yeah, it's true. Because he's been locked down there and he still does the job that he would normally do here. That's right. So I don't think it's necessarily yeah. a thing of the past. Um, it Certainly the DF was produced in Japan 
very much geared towards that market and also traditional photographers, I would say, worldwide. Yeah. People that wanted to maybe relive a little bit of their film photography. I mean, for example, we had someone just last week who bought a whole film outfit, yeah. then realized how expensive it is to get their film developed and printed and said, I'm sorry, I actually don't think I can afford to to continue shooting film. I'm going to have to find another solution. Mm. So the DF, for example, was trying to be that hybrid camera that would have the convenience of digital whilst also being uh, a kind of retrofitted yeah. camera. We oh. had a lot of people coming from film yeah. buying this ca camera specifically. As an because, entry point. Yeah, because they found it difficult to switch to something more than, let's say, like D800 or D780. That's right. Yeah. I have very, very well-known person of interest. You can't see his picture, but he's over there on the wall. Who came in, he was a an FM2N shooter. Is it a wanted poster? You can't <laughs> see it. I'm, it's gonna, I'm not going to mention any names. Um, he was an FM2N shooter, and um, his kind of... The, the thing that made him turn to digital was the DF, just for the simple reason that I said, look, Nikon make a hybrid um, between your beloved FM2N and, and a digital camera. And that was kind of like him dipping his toe into the yep. digital waters. So there you go. Um, I believe those that hate the DF can only be those who've never actually used one. It, that's an interesting, the Blue Serpent Media, does it have things that would have been nice? Oh God, yes. But for an ex-film photographer, it is awesome. On paper, yeah. if you're a professional photographer, and let's say you're losing, lo looking for latest specs. DF doesn't make sense no, sure. on paper. For what you do, it won't make sense. But for certain things, and especially yeah, if you're an enthusiast photographer, yeah. or you do a passion project, yeah. this is the perfect camera. As a documentary camera, it's fantastic. It's not really, let's say, the best sports camera or event camera, let's say, or reportage camera. No, but it works for everything. That's the thing. That's the thing. <laughs> That's right. I will say, so... In terms of that sensor, because um, Jan was asking if 16 megapixels is enough, um, if you are using manual focus lenses, I would say 16 megapixels, first of all, is enough, um, unless you're trying to print billboards mm -hmm. or on the side of buses or something like that. But also, if you're going to use that old heritage glass, it performs much better on on that kind of sweet spot of a sensor. Yeah. If you start to put a lens that was made in 1969 on a camera with 45 megapixels, it truly falls apart. In yeah. fact, even D lenses are not doing well. Yeah, exactly. On 36 megapixel plus sensor. That's right, which we yeah. talked about a couple of weeks ago. So um, I would say 16 to 24 megapixels yeah. is probably your limit. Not saying that you can't use your manual focus lenses on those higher resolution sensors, but just that you won't get the best out, mm -hmm. of, out of the glass. So 16 megapixels makes everything look yep. gorgeous. And That's... probably ZF2 would have 24 megapixels. <laughs> yes. BSI. Yeah, so we're talking... IBS. So, so ZF, so it's mirrorless. Yes. It's got 24 megapixel BSI sensor. Yes, it looks super retro. It looks super duper retro. It's smaller and lighter, but yes. it still takes the ENL 15 for that yes. longer battery life. It comes with a beanie cap. <laughs> <laughs> and a beard. That's my addition, yes. <laughs> and a fake beard. That's right. Yeah. Um, so that you can go super hipster um, and a, I'd say, a leather woven camera strap. Yes. Yep, there yes. we go. Sorted. Yes, vegetable leather. <laughs> that's vegetable leather, vegan leather. Vegan leather, that's the one. <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> ah, you know, potato, potato, doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, and it would be, um, it would be... Even better in low light than the DF, if that is even possible. <laughs> Technically, if we would release one now, it probably would be Z6. Yeah. Yeah? And the ship's close. So, yeah. yeah. FM2. It would be a Z6 in, in FZ, a ZF clothing, something like that. But That's true. In fact, the Z5 could have been that, you know? The Z5 could have been that, because it's such an oddball, that camera. Yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it actually makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cheers. Um, so I have to also say thank you to Gary and Adrian and Paul and Rob from the Netherlands and Peter for your contributions to the coffee stream. Thank you so much. Massively appreciated. Con is going to keep his coffee far away from my computer, but he's having his already. Um, I'm going to be having my. That's what they call social distancing. Okay. <laughs> and for and for the safety of my computer. <laughs> Um, Jan said that makes sense. So yes, exactly. AFD lenses. Can I tell you a little interesting tidbit? Please. So I've been using the 51.2 Z on my Z6 for the last month. Yes. Um, and I decided to do a little experiment. One of those geeky experiments where you put it on a tripod and you take a picture of exactly the same thing, right? With oh, different lenses. Like almost like a brick wall shot. Yeah, but okay. it was flowers. Okay. Um, 
and I used the 51.2 AIS and then I used my old trusty 55 1.2 AI mm -hmm. and I compared them all wide open mm -hmm. with the 51.2. Yeah. And honestly, the older AIS and AI lens was like shooting through the bottom of a milk bottle. It was so soft in comparison did you almost to feel like lens. you need to just wipe it a little bit yeah like, I, with a cloth thought, or I vaseline on the yeah. front of this lens like what's going on and then once i stopped it down they started to improve but there is you can really see the difference mm. now with these cameras so the z lenses it just kind of proved to me that the z lenses apart from being amazing um and obviously considerably more expensive and bigger but it just proves that those lenses perform beautifully on my FM3A, fantastic on the F6. They were even great on the D750. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they were okay on the D750, but on newer cameras, I couldn't use it on my D850. Mm -hmm. And the Z6, fine, 24 megapixels, but it's just interesting. Interesting mm -hmm. experiment. It is, it is. We, we are going to do a video. We are. Of all 50s, yes. Once we can go out and actually do things, yeah, outdoors, once we can take pictures outside, absolutely, and not of my kitchen table. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, we should draw our competition. People, yes, have we got any time? more people? It is pretty much the time. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, such a great camera that we just can't talk for hours about. It. <laughs> Literally, you know, and the different stories come up. That's right. You know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, let's do the competition again. It's for this book, which is called The Folio Society Book of the 100 Greatest Photographs. I think it's that's going to be edition. an interesting, both coffee table book and an interesting read. Okay, who's doing this this time? Me? Uh, you can, with, right. yeah, Ooh. you can draw the name. Nice. Lucky you. Okay. Not looking. Are you going to do the drum roll? Uh, All right, and the winner is, is it Mr. Gotteson? <laughs> <laughs> Blue Serpent Media. Oh! Oh, yay! Well done. Well done. Congratulations. So you dropped me an email um, to media at grazerwestminster.co.uk with your address details. I know I have it, but send them just in case. And we'll get that sent out to you. So very well done. Um, there, just to answer these couple of last questions, Colin said 55 1.2 has to be stopped down with a Z7. I agree, Colin. Yeah, you can't use it wide open. Um, I don't know if I'll do a whole stream on the 51.2 Z. We're going to do a video. In fact, Let's do the video, at okay. the end of the month, which is next week, I'm going to give you the 51.2. You're going yes, to give please. me the 70 to 200. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll compare notes. Speaking of 70 to 200, at the moment, <laughs> yes. I'm testing animal recognition, oh. tracking with Z6 and 70 to 200 2.8. With your puppy. With my puppy. <laughs> Since becoming a father last week. Yes. <laughs> a dog daddy. Um, Go to San says he's using an AI modified 24F 2.8 and a GN nickel, which is interesting. So Ooh, on GM. It, it was a 45 GM, was wasn't 45, it? It was a 45, yeah, exactly. It's a very interesting lens. Um, and just as a, a last little thing, William pointed out that if grandpa owns a bunch of F glass, get this camera. Because, Correct. <laughs> because then Absolutely. you can use everything. 100 points. That's right. 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 Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Please do give us a final thumbs up. We've had 137 likes and we have 230 people watching. So please do wow. give us a little thumbs up before we go. If you're not subscribed, absolutely please do subscribe. And um, we thank you very, very much for all of your comments and thank you so much. coffee fun contributions. We will see you next week yeah. for another stream. Mr. Gotosan, thank you so much thank as well for joining so us much, today. Thank you so much, Gotosan, for joining us. And if you do um, subscribe to this magazine, the interview is in issue 66. You might find that interesting. Yeah, you can download it in PDF form online. Yes, exactly. All right. Uh, I think we're done. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Yay!